Hello, Thrivers. Today, I want to talk about how to stop feeling responsible for someone else's anger. And the reality is, is that we can get sucked into thinking that we are responsible for the, another person's anger so covertly, we don't even realize it. Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about what it looks like, what it looks like to have people in your life that are making you feel responsible for their anger and how this shows up for you. The second thing I want to talk about is why this happens inside of you or why it's so hard for you to stop. Okay, we're going to talk about the trauma aspect of it. And then the last part of the video, as always, we're going to talk about what you can do about it. Okay, so with that in mind, let's dive in. For those that don't know me, my name is Michelle. I'm a life and relationship coach. I'm the founder of the Thriver School of Transformation, which is a membership where we meet live weekly and we work through the side effects of complex PTSD and childhood trauma together. So if that's something you might be interested in, there's the link to check it out. Okay, so let's talk about how feeling responsible for other people's anger might show up in your life. I'm going to give three different scenarios and you see and self-evaluate whether any of this sounds familiar in your case. The first scenario is in a work relationship. You want to tell your boss maybe that you need a day off and it's well in advance. You have more than enough time to let your boss know. But when you start telling your boss, your boss starts acting disappointed and starts complaining and kind of making you feel guilty. And so what happens as a result is you cancel whatever it is that you had planned, even though it meant a lot to you, you cancel it and you show up for work. Scenario two, let's say you're in a relationship and you put down a boundary in the sense that your partner, your significant other wants to do something over the weekend, but you have plans to be with your family, okay? Or maybe some friends that you haven't seen in a while. And so very lovingly, you let them know that, you know, you're not available this weekend, but you will see them the following. And your significant other gets so angry and so upset or so sad, so disappointed that you wind up canceling your plans with your family and doing whatever your significant other wants to do. The third scenario is, let's say you're in a long-term relationship and you have something that you enjoy doing. It could be a hobby or passionate that you're, you really love and that you're really good at. It could be something as simple as enjoying a cup of coffee first thing in the morning and just really enjoying and being present with yourself and, and allowing yourself to feel good and excited for the day. But every time you're doing something that you love, no matter how big or how small, your significant other doesn't say anything. They don't even tell you to not do those things, but their energy is so negative. The feeling of anger is so strong around them. And the second you stop doing what you love, their negative energy goes away and you notice that little by little, you stop doing the things you love. Now, if you were to ask your significant other, you know, if they are upset, if they don't like that you do this thing that you love, they would probably say, that's ridiculous. That's crazy. Why would I not let you do what you love? And, you know, it sounds good. Their words sound good, but their actions are on a different page. And our subconscious pays attention to our feelings more than words. And so little by little, you stop doing the things you love. In all three of those scenarios, the other person's anger is showing up in different ways. Okay. Because that when somebody's angry, sometimes we think that when someone's angry, it's very overt and they're yelling and they're out of control. Well, obviously that's anger, but somebody's anger can show up in other ways as well. It can show up in um, rejection. It can show up in them making you feel guilty as if you're doing something wrong. It can show up in negative energy that they're just allowing to come out of them so that you, you feel it and you think that you're doing something wrong. Or it can show up in just silence, in the silent treatment. Okay, there's so many different ways that people can display anger. I just want to put that out there because, you know, not everyone acts 
angry in the same way. But the point is, is when that other person is acting angry or disappointed or upset, the point is, is if it causes you to sacrifice self, then that's a problem. So there's a balance between recognizing that we affect how other people feel, right? When we treat them nice, they feel good. When we treat them disrespectfully and unloving, they feel bad. So I'm not saying that we should stop caring about how, you know, other people feel around us. But what I am saying is that if their feelings are causing you to sacrifice, delete, and erase you, then that's when it goes out of balance. So pause and ask yourself, where in your life are you stopping you from being you because it makes someone else upset, especially when the pieces that you're stopping are normal, like enjoying a cup of coffee, enjoying a hobby, allowing yourself to have time for yourself, allowing yourself to take a day off in advance for whatever you feel is important, allowing yourself to enjoy things. When you being you causes someone else to get angry and the things you're doing are normal, healthy behaviors, that's when you really wanna pay attention to the fact that this is manipulation and this can cause a lot of psychological damage for you, okay? So once you have identified where that's showing up in your life, The second thing to do is to understand why. And that's what we're going to get into now. Why is it that when somebody else gets upset, we cave, we give in, we um, sacrifice self because their anger makes us feel like we have to. It almost feels like an obligation. On a logical level, You might say, well, of course, I'm allowed to take this weekend for my family. I haven't seen my family in a long time. This is normal. The second you see somebody upset, that logic goes out the window. And the reason is because of trauma. For anyone that struggles to stay grounded when somebody else is upset or angry is normally because there's some kind of trauma that isn't resolved yet in you. Okay, and what I mean by that is that maybe in childhood, maybe um, you lived in a situation that didn't feel safe. Maybe your caregivers um, had a lot of anger. And anger for a child is scary because anger feels like rejection. And in childhood, rejection is directly related to survival. If you're rejected by your caregivers, who's going to take care of you? So if you lived in a situation where the other person or the caregiver in your life was constantly angry, to keep yourself safe, the child develops the coping skill of fawning. Okay, we have our fight, flight, freeze, and fawn trauma response. Fawn is, I'm stuck. There is nothing I can do but give in and and appease and do whatever I can to minimize the damage that can take place for me. And so you give in and you cave, hoping that this calms the other person and there's less abuse that you endure. In childhood, this is a really smart uh, coping skill. It's the same thing with animals. Animals use this coping skill and, and it can be very effective at times. You think of the gazelle that fawns and plays dead And so the lion thinks that it's dead, goes to get the family. The gazelle is there, shakes and moves on. Okay, that saved her from that situation. In a sense, the fawning was something that helped in childhood. The problem is, the problem is, is that that coping skill is maladaptive in adulthood and it causes nothing but relationship problems. Okay, so for example, if you are always fawning, for someone else, okay? And you're trying to be in a healthy relationship, but you think that being in a healthy relationship means making sure the other person is never upset. That means you're gonna always override your gut instinct. You're never gonna share your perspective. You're never going to say no. You're never going to bring you 
the real you to the table in the relationship, you're not really there. You're really just living as a kind of emotional regulator for the other person. And this caused problems in two ways. One, a healthy individual is not going to like that because there's not another person there. There's no like give and take. It's all this person trying to give you everything so that you're happy. But healthy people already have a sense of wholeness and they want somebody else that's whole and that comes into the picture and that can bring something into the picture. So you wind up not attracting healthy people or you don't feel comfortable in a healthy relationship. It doesn't feel good for you. So that leads to the other problem is that you wind up in toxic relationship after toxic relationship because toxic people love people that don't care about themselves and make it all about them. The problem with that is you are constantly being mistreated and you go from relationship to relationship feeling the same thing and it strengthens this belief that you can't have healthy relationships and if you don't and if you focus on the other person on how toxic they are which is true right they probably if you're in a relationship with somebody toxic they are doing so many manipulative unloving and toxic um, behaviors but focusing on them isn't going to break you out of that loop because there's something trauma causes something in you that is allowing this. And I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to put blame. Okay. I, I want to clear this up. I'm not saying it's your fault that the other person is toxic. That's them. But at some point, at some point we have to realize that we have power to change the situation. We have power to break out of that cycle, but it involves change. We can't keep thinking the same things. We can't keep doing the same things. We can't keep having the same beliefs and expect change. So there are things we have to do that help us to break out of that cycle. And that's what I want to get into now. So what can you do to break out of feeling like you're responsible for other people's anger? The first thing, the first thing that is so important is to recognize that time is not what's going to heal this. I say this because some people will be like, okay, these people are toxic. I'm going to get them out of my life and then I'm healing and that now things will be different. Well, yes, we do have to detox, right? And, and change who we spend time with. But that's not going to break the cycle. That's going to remove the current people that are toxic from our life. If we don't change the things that are happening within, we can repeat that cycle. So the second thing to recognize is the fact that we have to do some rewiring. We have to do some internal changes. We have to do some work on the nervous system so that we change the stories that are embedded within it. Okay, we, we have to change our neuroception. Neuroception is when our body is constantly scanning and looking for cues of danger. And this happens below our subconscious. Okay, so it's not like it's in our conscious awareness. We might feel the physiological responses that are happening in our body, but that doesn't mean we understand the why or what's going on with our neuroception. Okay, so in regards to anger, and what happens is, those feelings that come up are communicating to our brain that we aren't safe. The brain has a story that it gets attached to. Okay, so for example, our brain, our brain, in order to conserve energy, it memorizes certain things. Okay, so like when we ride a bike, we learn to ride a bike, I should say. In the beginning, that's a lot of brain effort to learn how to do it. But once we learn how the brain memorizes it, so we don't have to constantly be working the brain to learn how to do it. Same thing with walking, right? In the beginning, it's a lot of effort to learn how to walk as an infant, but once the brain knows it, boom, it's, it's memorized. Well, it does that with a lot of things that we went through in childhood, especially trauma. Okay, the brain pays major attention to trauma. So for example, if in childhood, your parent was super angry 
when you did something you loved or when you said no or when you tried to be authentic and you had to appease that right you had to sacrifice self so that your parent didn't stay that angry because your logic was i need somebody to take care of me what happens is that becomes memorized in your nervous system as well and now anytime somebody gets angry and upset your brain sends you those uncomfortable emotions that you felt in childhood and what it's trying to communicate to you is that this is dangerous you need to do what it learned to do because that's what kept you safe for so long which was sacrifice self or appease right do that because that's what worked and you feel all these sensations you feel this fear of this person's anger you feel the uncomfortableness in your body you cave in you appease that person gets happy, you feel a measure of relief. That's what's going on in your neuroception. And until you peel it back, you can be stuck in that story. And how it's maladaptive now is think about that. Let's say I'm in a relationship and I'm having a cup of coffee and I'm loving my cup of coffee. And this person is like sending me daggers just because they don't like that I'm happy. Not because I'm doing anything wrong, but because they have a personality disorder. If my neuroception says that person's angry, that means I'm bad, something bad's gonna happen. Your life is in danger, your whole survival is in danger. And that's the story that's going on in my neuroception, outside my conscious awareness, but it's in my subconscious programming. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm gonna stop drinking my cup of coffee. So, and that caving or that appeasing isn't gonna go away no matter how much time goes on. It will only go away when I learn how to peel the story back, how to change my subconscious programs, how to rewire my nervous system or imprint my nervous system in a way that it doesn't have those paired associations anymore. And that takes learning how to change my neuroception. It's kind of like a city. Think of our, our neural pathways in our brain are like roads in our mind. Okay. And let's say there's a city and there's this one road that's super dangerous and so another road needs to be built a safe road needs to be built well i can have that understanding i can have that logic but sitting back and recognizing that isn't enough now the city actually has to do the work to to make that safe road well we kind of have to do that in our brain we have to create those neural pathways our subconscious mind isn't going to do it without our conscious help. So in summary, if you grew up in an environment where other people's anger, you were made to feel like you had to make them happy because your survival depended on it until you work through it, that's going to show up in your relationships. It's going to prevent you from having healthy relationships. It's going to prevent you from having a healthy relationship with yourself. Why? Because you're always denying your authentic self hiding your authentic self because that might make somebody else unhappy so i encourage you i encourage you to be willing to do the inner work to change because you are not put on this planet to make sure everyone else never gets angry anger is a part of life being disappointed is a part of life people feel anger people feel unhappy people feel disappointed people feel let down and that's okay your job isn't to make sure People never feel that. And think about it. Have you ever been successful? No matter how much you erase yourself, have you ever really made sure that the other person is never not angry? No, because the strategy doesn't work and it only hurts you. Okay, so I hope this video is helpful. If anyone needs help with the rewiring process, with imprinting your nervous system, that's what we do in the Thriver School of Transformation. We meet weekly on Zoom because the subconscious mind learns through repetition plus emotions. So if you wanna join us again, here's the link for that.